All right, well, this evening we are talking to Dr. Robert Malillo. So, hello, Dr. Robert Malillo. Welcome hello. to New York. So, this conversation tonight is going to center around um, infant development for parents. And Dr. Malillo has extensive background in this 30 years of clinical research and professorship, and as an author and a lecturer and speaker. And an amazing teacher, actually, because uh, many of us have taken his courses and learned a tremendous amount. And with the extensively large brain that he has, he's developed another more intensive neuroanatomy course <laughs> for us to learn even more at a deeper level, which is amazing. So his specialty is childhood neurological disorders and ranging from autism spectrum to ADD, bipolar, um, dyslexia, which is an interesting one that we should do a whole separate interview on, I think. Um, even though it does come down to the same thing, it's a big issue here. Um, but so tonight I just wanted to focus on babies and growing babies, infant milestones and their primitive reflexes and what happens if they don't integrate properly and then go into retained reflexes. So welcome and I'm just going to let you roll. <laughs> You sounds great. And first of all, to the audience, I'm not just trying to be cool. I had some eye surgery and I have to wear these glasses for a few days. So and I did not want to miss this. So I, I apologize. Um, but um, yeah, so, you know, this area of uh, brain development and child development has really been something of a focus of mine, not only because my background is in neurology and, and rehabilitation and where I focused most of my career on, but also as a parent of kids that have had their own developmental issues. Um, so I really relate to the parent out there who's looking for answers and who's not getting them typically, because I remember when this first happened that I already knew a lot about neurology and I was teaching it on a diplomate level, but I didn't know a lot about child neurology or development. And I didn't know a lot about ADHD or autism or OCD or those things until one of my children got a diagnosis. And my first question was, what is it? What is actually happening in the brain of someone with ADHD or one of these other labels? So I went around to colleagues that I work with because I was trying to go the easy route, right? And just have somebody tell me what was wrong so I could try to see if I could come up with a way of trying to help it. Um, and so I went around to pediatricians, pediatric neurologists, neuropsychologists, pediatric psychologists. And I just asked the question, what is actually happening in the brain in ADHD? And they all looked at me like I was crazy. And they said, I don't know, I have no idea. And I was like, what do you mean? Somebody, somebody must know. And they were like, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what it is, but, um, and I was, you know, we had just seen, this was 1995. and a statistic had just come out between 90 and 95 that there was a 250% increase in the um, prescription of, of Ritalin and the medication primarily used for ADHD. And, you know, but yet nobody knew why, right? Why it was increasing or what it was. So for me, as a parent and a clinician, you know, I had to start there, which what is it? So I, you know, kind of dove into the research on my own and um, and eventually connected with researchers and other people around the world that did have a clue as to what was happening. And, um, you know, spent the better part of 10 years really researching it and ultimately creating a textbook. And most importantly, coming up with a program that could try to help these issues. But, you know, part of understanding what the problem was is also how it happened. And it ended up that, you know, it was a problem that happened during development and it wasn't due to damage or injury. It wasn't a genetic mutation, um, that there were developmental environmental factors that created this type of imbalance in the brain. That is what we then label as ADHD or some other disorder. Um, and, you know, along with that, you know, became aware of something known as primitive reflexes, which are these reflexes that babies are born with in the first year and they should go away. And there was more and more literature starting to emerge that some kids that had developmental delays didn't get rid of these reflexes, which would mean that something was affecting their development 
And then I've spent the better part of 30 years trying to understand that. And even now I'm doing a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. And the whole focus of my research is the importance of primitive reflexes in autism and what it actually does to brain connectivity. And then what happens when you're able to inhibit or suppress those reflexes and how does that change autism and functional connectivity? That's amazing. That is amazing. And it's interesting because with all of those different labels, you've just put them all under one Im umbrella called brain imbalance. Yeah, that's, and that's a really important thing, Marion, that I came across early on. You know, um, you know, when I first started looking at this, having a background, obviously, in, in physical chiropractic rehab, neurology, you, you were trained to look at imbalances, right? We're trained to look at imbalances in the body, imbalances in the nervous system. And um, so when I first started looking into ADHD and into other disorders, the first thing I came across was that researchers were talking about this unevenness of skills where kids with ADHD were exceptional, not just good, but exceptional at certain things, but were also really, really um, you know, behind in other things. And so right from the beginning, it sounded to me like some sort of imbalance. And I said, I wonder what the things they're good at. And I looked at that and I wonder what they're bad at. And I looked at that and all the things that they were good at, all of them were left hemisphere and all the things that they weren't good at were right hemisphere. And so I looked at it and I was like, wait a second, that, that, is that a coincidence? Or is that actually what's happening? And so the more I looked at it, the more it fell into place that way. And then I went to a lecture at the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington. And the woman who was the head of the uh, National Institute of Mental Health stood up. And it was a lecture about ADHD and other disorders. And she said, we don't really know exactly what is happening in ADHD and in the brain. But what's ever happening in ADHD is happening in all these other disorders because they're always comorbid with one another and they have very, very similar features. So we believe there's a similar underlying problem even though they manifest differently. So now I said, so if I'm seeing this imbalance in ADHD, you're saying that these other disorders are the same issue so then I started looking at them, and again, all of them had this unevenness of skills, um, and especially autism, and dyslexia also had it, but it was the exact opposite, right? The exact opposite features. So then I started, you know, that's when I started looking at and saying, okay, there's actually this single underlying problem known as a functional disconnection syndrome, and it manifests differently depending on what networks and what areas are overactive and underactive and disconnected. So it can manifest, but the underlying problem is the same. And so the solution is similar, right? So that's where it kind of all came together for me and then really focused on that. And I find that with parents and even with clinicians, you know, there's so many different symptoms and it's so different in each child that it becomes so overwhelming and it doesn't seem to make any sense unless you look at it in the light of how the hemispheres work and function. And if you understand that they have many, it's, it's really not many different problems. It's one problem manifesting in many ways. And so it becomes less overwhelming because otherwise the parent really just thinks, wow, my child has so many things wrong with them how am I ever going to help them, right? Because they have dietary issues and motor issues and sensory issues and cognitive issues and behavioral issues and immune issues and, you know, and all of these things, it's overwhelming unless you say, nope, that's all related to one problem. It's much more manageable. Yeah, it makes more sense too, because it's very easy for a parent with a child who's struggling to go into overwhelm instantly because they've been fighting those battles for a long time before they start to actually get any sort of help if they get it. Right. So that's a big thing. So if we back up a little bit and just talk about milestones and the importance of meeting those milestones, you know, in terms of infant growth and development, mm -hmm. how it leads on to the primitive, the retained reflexes. 
Right. So, you know, when, when I went back and, and said, okay, where does this start, this imbalance? And how could that happen, right? How could it happen? Why, if the brain is growing, why would one side grow less than the other? What would be that mechanism? And it turns out that that's the way the brain grows, that the right brain actually is more active and grows uh, more the first two to three years. And then the left brain is emphasized for the next two to three years. Both sides of the brain are growing, but one side of the brain is more active, only about 20 or 30 percent. But that's enough that it creates the difference. And that factor is really what makes the right brain and the left brain actually grow, develop and function differently from one another, because there aren't really a lot of genetic factors. The right brain and the left brain are not programmed differently. Anatomically, they look almost I identical. So why do they actually develop and function differently, which, I know, which we know is a big advantage. And we know that humans have the most asymmetric brain. So the idea that as the brain is growing, it, if something interferes with growth and development during the first three years, it may have more of an impact or slow down the development of the right brain, which may make the left brain kick in too early and come online too soon, which then sets up this imbalance, right? Because then now then the left brain, when it does kick in, it's, it's already stronger than it should be. And now it gets even stronger. And this is this developmental imbalance between the hemispheres that affects the communication and the integration and the synchronization, which is critical to the human brain, because our brain is so big and so different that it needs to be really synchronized and coordinated. So the growth and development, we go through these stages of development and movement and motor development is the single most critical piece to development of the brain, especially early on, because movement is what engages our senses and our senses then give feedback to our brain and that not only stimulates the brain and the genes that cause growth but it also helps to calibrate our brain to the world around us um, and you know when we're first born we don't have much of a brain and we don't have much of a motor cortex so we are dependent on certain reflexes that are from our brain stem that allow us to move and interact and engage those senses and calibrate it to the world um, until our motor cortex then grows and kicks in and can take over. Um, so what we see is that if, again, anything interferes with that normal growth and development, and as those reflexes emerge, we go through different motor milestones. And these motor milestones are there for a reason. And we need to go through them and you know we've known about them for many 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 years and we know that they're there and we know that you know children should roll over around three to five months and then they should roll on their belly and then they should crawl on their belly and then they should be able to sit up at around six months and then crawl on all fours and then get up and start cruising along the furniture and then almost exactly at one year they should take their first step independently and that's the blueprint of how the brain is built. And it's a blueprint that's been there since the beginning of time. And, you know, what we see is that there's more deviation than ever in that blueprint. We see more kids than ever that don't crawl on time or don't crawl in the right way or walk too early or walk too late. And then if you walk late, you're going to talk late. And if you talk late, you're going to have, you know, maybe uh, social problems or language based problems. And it once as you miss these milestones, they become more and more and more missed down the road. And, you know, it may not fully impact you until you're a full grown adult, you know, schizophrenia, which we know starts this same way, doesn't really manifest until someone's in their 20s. But there are clues all along the way that something is not right, but it doesn't fully manifest until until 20s. But the problem really goes back to uh, early childhood. So, you know, it may manifest at different stages, but um, 
you know, the whatever happens in the first six years of the child brain is the ultimate fate of the adult brain. And, you know, in the United States, we have 20 percent of kids have some sort of diagnosis, whether it's a learning disability or behavioral or mental, emotional. And there's 20 percent of adults that have that same diagnosis. So is that a coincidence or is it just the same population that never was actually treated properly? And they go on to have those problems later on in life because they they've been there their whole life. Yeah, and I think you're right there. And it's interesting because in our practice, one of the things we see kids of all ages, but we try to catch them in those very early stages, especially from either preconception through the pregnancy where we're looking after mom and then the baby comes straight in afterwards and we can monitor then because once post-birth stuff, everybody's breastfeeding and happy, then we'll back off and watch them grow. And then we'll just kind of do those growth and development checks, especially over those first two years where the brain is growing at a rapid, rapid pace because right. we don't want to miss those things. And I think for families that aren't involved with that kind of care, these things already have been missed along the way. I know those little milestones and those things that they're just told, oh, they'll grow out of it. Oh, they'll do this, I'll do that. You know, like crawling on one knee, that kind of stuff, you know, or not walking until they're after two or right. three months to, and it, which is really late, you know, so trying to catch all those things because they get referred to different channels here because the healthcare system in the UK is different than the US, but there might be a waiting list of 18 weeks. So in that period, five months in a child's life is a long time. So, you know, trying to find ways for people to get those things picked up earlier on is a big issue. So the GP will do a check between six and eight weeks here, and they might not see that child again, unless there's a problem. You know, either they have ear infections or throat infections, or, you know, maybe later they aren't speaking or crawling, you know, so all of those kind of things fall by the wayside quite quickly here. Absolutely. And that's one of the one of the purposes of my PhD. And I'm working with a team of really, really uh, great neurologists, mostly, um, and um, other people in more of the, you know, psychological world. But uh, one of our goals is that, you know, people, pediatricians used to look at primitive reflexes, and most of them don't anymore. And pediatric neurologists still do, but they only look at it for the first year. And they don't look beyond that. Um, and along with that is the, you know, the idea that these milestones are important because what has been recently, you know, there was one psychologist in the United States that came out and wrote an article and got a lot of attention because he was saying that, you know, looking statistically now, 50% of kids don't crawl in a normal way. So that means that crawling is not normal. Right. And that crawling in a normal way is not normal. So he's advocating to say um, all of these other ways of crawling are normal now because we have more kids crawling abnormally. And to me, I look at that and I'm like, that's insane. All you're doing is normalizing pathology and you're not also putting it in the context of saying, well, we also see this epidemic rise of neurobehavioral issues in kids. And maybe there's a relationship there, right, that we should be concerned about instead of, you know, just saying, hey, you know, just accept it and it's normal and nothing's wrong and nothing's abnormal. And some and he's even saying that, you know, it's it's OK if they don't walk until they're two. And that's it. I think it's so um, wrong and, um, you know, and just really gives such a wrong message. But they don't know what to do about it and so rather than making people and making moms stressed out or you know making parents feel bad they figure well let's just you know say well there's nothing to worry about um because what are we going to do anyway right so i remember i i, I had one mom who said to me you know why do they give us this list of milestones when we have a baby and then as soon as the baby doesn't hit the milestone, if we say to them, the baby doesn't hit the milestone, they say, well, it doesn't matter anyway. Then why do they give us these milestones if it doesn't matter? And that's the thing. So in my PhD, what we're trying to do is, is understand development and primitive reflexes and motor development 
and then put it into the context of of the the milestones and then say you know it does matter and here's something simple that you can do because if we give them something to do that is easy that they can teach the parents that's going to have a big impact then i think then they'll be more comfortable with saying okay let's let's pay more attention to this uh, rather than just saying well we can't do anything anyway so why worry people if you know if it doesn't matter it's cop out isn't it it's a, and it has a tremendous lifelong effect on the children that we see you know and certainly you know my fellow chiropractors would see all kinds of children that will have different crawling issues in particular you know from bum shuffling and all the way through to crawling on one leg or not crawling at all or not walking until the age of two and i think those are really huge things and certainly you know that whole brain growth under the age of two and then to four to seven to nine and the rest of it all those developmental stages are the rest of your life and i think people underestimate that that's really the time that that groundwork has to be laid. And I know in other areas, when you look at trauma and adverse childhood events, and then you look at connection and attachment, all of those things are the same thing because they have a huge effect on the development of the brain and therefore the person they become. Absolutely. As we said, you know, the, the fate of the adult brain is really in that early, in those, in the, especially those first six years when those hemispheres are forming and when they should be connecting. And that's the foundation, you know, and that's what I, I, I tell people, you know, and, and y y the idea that the brain needs to build from this bottom up, like building a building, you know, you need to build from the foundation up. And then the brain comes down and regulates everything like a CEO and controls it all. Um, but it doesn't come down if you don't finish the bottom up development. And uh, I think, you know, that, you know, there was a, a study at Harvard on my work independently at Harvard Medical School. And that's, you know, they looked at my work in ADHD and this is exactly their conclusion that what they saw in brain imaging was exactly that. The idea that we need to build the brain from the bottom up and that that is associated with the reflexes and we need to integrate those reflexes so that the brain can complete the bottom up development and then regulate from the top down. But this also promotes the integration of the entire nervous system and the two hemispheres. And all of that has to happen simultaneously. It doesn't just happen one, but it all happens together. And if it doesn't happen, this is the problem. This, that is what is the, the core issue. So, you know, anybody thinking about it, yeah, I mean, if you don't build a foundation, then, you know, you're not going to be able to build the whole building. It makes sense. Yeah, it is. It's that development. It's kind of like climbing up a ladder. Each stage has to meet the next stage or you can't reach the next rung. Right. It just kind of goes sideways a little bit, you know, and starting with parents and giving parents something to do at home, especially empowering them to recognize that they are developing, but... They're not sick. They're not, there's not a pathology there, but there is a functional issue that needs to be addressed, you know, in terms of there's not something wrong with the child, but what we need to do is bring that back together. So there is some integration in the right time, right. To help their child. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, from my research and the way I like to explain it to parents is that more often than not, the reason why the problem happens is because the child is actually too good at certain things, right? There's traits. And, you know, um, when we look at left brain dominant trait, people that are highly intelligent, people that it's called an intellect trait, and that are very left brain dominant, you know, analytical people, Simon Baron Cohen from Cambridge, did a study, uh, many studies where he showed that, you know, in in the families of kids with autism, you have a lot of people that are like uh, physics professors or mathematicians or people. He also showed that anywhere where there's a lot of people in the IT world or engineering world, that they are much more likely to have children with autism or autism traits. Um, and so it's built on a natural trait, which is this left brain dominance, which is a good thing. I mean, obviously, people do well. But if you have too much of that good thing, 
and it and the right brain is delayed in its development then you develop this imbalance and this is where you see these kids can have these genius level left brain skills um, but yet be so disconnected that you know they can't function in the social world and they can't function interpersonally and may may not be able to speak not because their left brain is a problem but because they're so disconnected from their body and their feelings and their emotions and other people that they don't speak because of that so you know it's it's part of a normal trait that runs in family so it's really not a deficiency there's no damage there's no injury there's nothing necessarily wrong with the genes um, they may not be expressed fully the way they should but they're not damaged um, and most people are told these are genetic disorders and there's nothing you can do about it and that's not true um, they're what we call epigenetic which means they're primarily environmental um, and so you know these are just built on top of a trait that is too good. So it's a different context when you understand that there's not something wrong with your child. It's that certain areas of the brain are a little too strong and we just have to create a balance. And when we do that, you know, you can have this actually very, very high functioning, amazing person. That's what's an easier outcome, isn't it? It's trying to make things easier for your child. You know, because anything, especially with struggling with social interactions, it, it affects the whole family, but most especially that child who has social anxieties, who gets re doesn't really interact well, and being able to change that right. is life changing for all of them. Yeah, making it easier doesn't mean we play to their strengths, because that's a problem. Yep. What most people, most people's approach is, well, we can't change their weaknesses, so let's just play to their strengths. And if you look at it in the context of a developmental imbalance, all you're going to do is make that imbalance worse. So you have to focus, you know, on stimulating or activating or, you know, trying to build up their weaknesses. And that creates this balance. Um, if you focus on their strengths, you know, they're never going to change and they're actually just going to get worse over time. And that's a difficult conversation, isn't it? You know, because trying to get them to understand it is about brain balance and the issue that, you know, they come to see you because they know something isn't right, but at the same time, they don't want to be made to feel wrong or like they've been a bad parent because they haven't been a bad parent. No. Right? So there's been a whole chain of events that has led to a child being in this position, right? right, And we want to look at that to see where they've come from, but that's not where the focus is. The focus is on, well, how do we bring balance into things? You right. know, trying to re-empower a parent to know they know their child better than anybody else and to give them the tools to help things and help their child move forward. And that's it. You know, it's, you know, the tools we give to parents are pretty simple tools that anybody can do. Um, but they need to be done consistently. They need to be done properly. They need to be done at a high frequency. Um, but when they're done right in the right combination, um, it is just the the results are, are uh, absolutely remarkable. There's nothing else like it. And, you know, it's something that the parents are the ones that should be doing it. And because their child is, they're going to be their child's, they're the best person to be their child's therapist. Um, as long as we, and we don't overwhelm them when we give them simple tools to do, it can be incredibly effective and obviously cost effective as well. Yeah, which is really helpful, you know, because again, many kids who are struggling with different things, the costs do add up, right? Yeah. Because they end up seeing so many different other people. So the more that they can do for themselves and their child at home, the better. So. Yeah, and, and, you know, when you're in a, uh, especially if you're in a kind of a socialist model of healthcare where there's a lot of, you know, trying to really be aware of costs and rationing. Um, the frequency that's needed to make the changes, I mean, these things have to be done two to three times a day for months um, or even years to really, you know, create these changes. And so, you know, if you're trying to do it in the context of a healthcare system, it's not going to work because it's going to be too expensive and, and it's not going to work. So, you know, recruiting the parents um, to really deliver this along with the supervision of a healthcare provider that is knowledgeable is really the, the best case scenario.
So I just wanted to ask one more question about dyslexia, because mm -hmm. that's something that we see a lot of. And obviously the brain balance, you kind of touched on the left and the right brain. Is right. it particularly a right brain issue? Well, what we see is that the, when we're talking about issues, first of all, I'm, I'm, I always get my wife always yells at me because I'm, I'm, she's like, you mean a right brain weakness or a right brain dominance, right? So it can be confusing. But when we're looking at um, a right brain delay in development with an overactive left, right? So a left brain dominance with a right brain deficit or delay or immaturity, that is what we see with ADHD, autism, OCD, tics, Tourette's, oppositional defiant disorder, um, schizophrenia, uh, anxiety, um, you know, those types of issues. When we look at the opposite, where we have a left brain delay and a right brain over strength dominance, uh, we see that as dyslexia, learning disabilities, you know, more language learning issues like math problems, spelling, reading. Um, we also see that as depression. We also see that as bipolar disorder um, and PTSD like symptoms. Um, where we see this overemphasis of the emotional aspects of the brain, um, the overwhelming feelings of guilt and shame and, you know, being uh, hyper aware of what other people think and, you know, uh, a lot of really emotional issues. So that's kind of how that works. And again, of course, there are different areas and different networks and how they actually combine together is unique, right? But overall, because again, it comes down to how these two hemispheres develop and how they connect or don't connect. But, you know, it's superimposed on natural strengths and weaknesses, traits, what areas, uh, what, what timing um, did the, you know, did the imbalance start? All of those different things come into play. But there's ways of measuring that and identifying where there are specific weaknesses and where there are overactive areas and and targeting those areas and those networks with different types of stimulation and activities. So in your book, Disconnected Kids, you have a test in there that people can do to get an idea if they're right or left brain dominant. So that's a, a kind of a helpful place to start, isn't it? Just to give them an idea. Absolutely. I think I tell parents a couple of things as we were just talking, did your child, you know, miss or were they significantly delayed in milestones. Now, a lot of parents may not know that or remember it, or again, what I consider and what you consider to be delayed may be different than what their pediatrician told them was delayed. So they may not know that, but they, they may know, did your child crawl? Did they crawl in the right way? When did they walk? But also, are there these, is this their unevenness of skills in your child where they're really good and maybe even exceptional at certain things? Like maybe they're a really great artist or maybe they love Legos or, you know, maybe they're just an early word reader. I had a child today who's autistic who started reading words at 18 months, at two years. You know, the parents were saying the child would like say seven UP and they were like, what is that? Seven UP. And then they realized he was reading the label for seven up, right? The soda. Um, and, you know, he was, he was two years of age. So are there these, you know, kind of standout abilities or skills or things that they're really good at? And are there other things that they really seem to be uh, behind? And especially, it may not make sense to you, you know, like a child can be an early word reader, like this child, but now then they got to the point where they hate reading, and they don't read at all, even though they could read younger than almost any other child. And so, and, and they don't comprehend anything that they're reading. So now it's like, wait a second, how can they be an early word reader, but not comprehend anything? If you understand how the hemispheres work, it makes perfect sense. So, you know, that's what I tell parents is, you know, what the, is there this unevenness of skills? Um, was there any, you know, delays or missed milestones or, you know, are they awkward and clumsy with their movements in any way? Um, you know, all those things are little clues that give you an idea that there is this imbalance that developed in your child. And then, you know, then from there, it's just a matter of figuring out where it is. And that checklist that I have in my book really is a good way of looking at it and saying, okay, you know, is it more of a right brain or left brain delay? And, 
you know, it gives you a good window. It's not always 100% accurate, but it's it's pretty darn accurate. I mean, again, we've worked sure. in my centers with, you know, with over 70,000 kids where parents have filled those checklists up before, during, and after, and then, you know, have, you know, several hundred thousand books that have been sold. And and the, for the most part, it's it's pretty darn accurate, so. That's good. With parents, when they have these children that are kind of prodigies at one thing and are really excited about it and want to encourage it and play to their strengths, um, trying to convince them that they the brain needs to come back into balance and they're scared that, well, they'll lose those traits. I'm like, well, they might lose a little bit, but what they gain in that balance is greater than any other thing that you can think about in terms of their whole life development. Right. It's, it's quite a big thing because it, it feels scary to some to create change in their child. Sure. They love their child just as their child is, regardless of what's going on. So it's just trying to kind of get through that barrier, if you mean, because there's a little bit of defensiveness there. Do you know what I mean? You know, we live in a world of very mixed messages now as well. Um, and, you know, on one hand, you know, we want people to be healthy, but on the other hand, we want to be accepting of everybody, right? And that's good. I mean, we should be accepting of everybody, but there's a difference between, you know, parents will, sometimes they'll say, you know, my family is telling me just to leave the child alone because, you know, this is who they are and just, you know, accept them for who they are and that's it. And I look at it and I say, you know, I look at it differently. I look at it like they're not who they're supposed to be. And the reason we know that is because their development is off and they have things that should not be there. Like they still have these reflexes that should be gone and they're missing these milestones and they're deficient in these areas. And I think you're not seeing who, this is not who the child was supposed to be. This is, you know, a, a, a different version. And so I think what we want to do is actually do everything we can to try to get that child to be who they were destined to be and let that, that person come out. And one of the things I hear from parents over the years that really moves me is when they say to me, thank you, you gave us the child that we always knew was there, but was trapped and couldn't get out. And that's how I look at it, right? Like, and so, and the idea that, you know, they may have these great skills, these genius level skills, and the parents can see that and appreciate it. But there's also these other issues and they don't want them to lose those skills. And that makes sense. But I can tell you because we've done so much in the way of objective testing, like IQ testing and academic achievement tests, where we graphically document this unevenness of skills that represents an unevenness in the brain. And we get kids that, you know, might be three, four, five, six grade levels above in certain things. And then they might be three or four or five or six grade levels below. We have some kids that are 10, 11, 12 years apart from their strengths and weaknesses at the age of 10, right? And then what we see is that when we build up that underactive side, this may go down a little bit or hardly not at all, but this just comes up. So they don't lose those natural functions, those natural skills they but they don't it's not as obsessive it's not as out of control so it, it's more manageable and they don't also have those really significant weaknesses that go along with it that they can't manage their emotions or they can't control their behavior or you know all of those other things so we know that they don't functionally lose their skill when we build up the other side it actually just makes it more accessible it makes them, it, it puts them into that place where they are relaxed and at ease with who they are, rather than always trying to find that intern, internal place of compensating in some way, if that makes yeah. sense. Like we said, it, it allows them to become who they were always meant to be. Um, and that's a different mentality. If you think about it, I can, I can understand both, right? I can understand we have compassion and we want, you know, I work with kids and adults with disabilities and, 
and I, you know, I, I want nothing more than to be, them be accepted and treated in a respectful way and have them, you know, be loved and all of those things. But there's also when I see that there's potential to really improve them and to improve their quality of life and to, you know, maybe really bring out their full potential, you know, that's something I can't ignore. And I'm not just going to accept that when I know we can change it. And I know the parents feel that way too, because otherwise they wouldn't be seeing me. Right. It's interesting actually, because I mean, we have the TV version of autism, um, which is quite pretty. Um, but then we have some very, very serious cases of autism of parents who very rarely even leave the home, you know, with those kids who are desperately struggling um, and then the parents are desperately struggling on many, many levels as well. And your work for those families has been tremendous. You know? And that's been my focus really, especially over the past five years is really working with the most severe cases that I can get my hands on to really perfect the model of what, what can be done and what can be expected. And, and I'm, and it's, you know, I'm constantly amazed at the results that we're getting, um, and, you know, again, that's like, you know, you get people on the Internet um, with autism that sometimes attack me and say, just leave everybody alone. We don't want your help. We don't want. And then you'll have a parent that comes in and, you know, and if we can get a child to speak that would have never spoken. Um, are you saying that we should just ignore that? We should just allow that person to go through their life not being able to speak just simply because you know, you felt like, you know, you wanted just to be accepted and you're speaking for yourself. If you don't want any help, if you just want to be that, that's great, right? But this child can't speak for themselves. And this and these parents are desperate and you don't know what their life looks like every day. So if we can give them a little bit of relief or maybe even complete relief in some cases, then, you know, I think it would be unethical not to do that. Great. It's tremendous, tremendous stuff. You still, are you still doing the series on YouTube where you worked with families and. No, we, um, we did that for two seasons and, um, you know, and we still have that on there, but we, we don't, we, you know, we were hoping to get some sponsors and there was a TV network that was supposed to pick it up. And, you know, it was, uh, something that we really uh, wanted to do and did, as an as an example series to watch and it really is it, it's so real for one thing but also for parents who are experiencing all these different issues it gives them a completely different perspective that something else is out there to help their children right the very natural approach that's working on the brain balance of their child rather than using medication to suppress their child Right. Very, very different approach. And I think it's it gives hope to a lot of people to see the success of that. So and also, again, you know, with the materials that you've published, it puts an, an awful lot of very good scientific information in parents hands that, you know, lay people can read it with no science background at all and understand the basics of those brain balances and how it applies to their child. And I think that is a tremendous work for a life's work and you're not even a quarter of the way through it <laughs> you know because you're you keep going <laughs> and developing you know with the phd with the neuroanatomy courses with everything yeah. to teach all of us to help other people which i think is a remarkable gift really well you know with um you know with this again i as i said i started as a parent in this you know not just as a clinician so i have and it's the parents and you know they're their sacrifices and their struggles that motivate me. Of course, the children do too, but it's the impact that it can have when you change that, what it does to the family and the family dynamic and the parents. And it's just, you know, so uh, important. I couldn't imagine spending my life doing anything else. And when you're doing that, you know, I don't think you're ever satisfied. You're always like, okay, I want to do better. I want to do more. And again, you know, you know, because when, a lot of what I did, even though it is founded in really great science, um, of course, it, it's it's very different from mainstream medicine and mainstream psychology and mainstream education, um, because that isn't really based on actual neuroscience, right? 
And so, you know, going up against that, of course, is always difficult. And, you know, I just had a family from the UK that I just spoke with the mom two days ago. And she said to me, you know, your work is unbelievable and it's changed my daughter's life. But how come more people don't know about this? Like, you know, uh, how come, you know, everybody doesn't know about this. And so that's part of my mission is to be able to get it out there and to share it with other people and share it with parents and clinicians and, and make a difference. And, you know, it's been translated into 15 language now for a reason, um, because it does resonate with people. And I think fortunately, we're, we were able to explain it very complex stuff in a way that the average parent can understand and utilize and make a big difference. And those are the three things, you know, you understand it, you can actually use it and what you use is going to make a big impact. And that's basically what this work is about. It's remarkable. And I think it comes down to that basic tenet as well, that you don't realize just how powerful you are. You know, whether it's your immune system, whether it's just your brain function and your ability to grow and develop and the potential that you have as a human being, which is untapped, you know, so that I think your work really does address so many things and the approaches are so direct and they're so simple once you know what you're dealing with, you know, the, you know, not, I don't want to use the word diagnosis, but I think when you're looking at the whole range of testing that goes through there to develop a plan for that child right. you know, is just remarkable what happens. The, the good, the, the good thing about it also, Marion, is that, you know, there's no downside per se, meaning that if you don't get results from it, it's not going to do anything damaging. And if the parent does most of the work, then there isn't really that much of a financial risk, right? Um, so, you know, it's something that, you know, there's really only a potential upside and not really much of a downside where there's a lot of treatments out there that, you know, there's a lot of risk to them. You know, there's a lot of side effects. There's a lot of negative outcomes and expense um, that can be associated with it. Um, not that, you know, I mean, it's it's okay to spend money if 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 it's if you're getting if you're getting a result is it's important but you know this is something that um you know people can really uh, utilize well, the biggest they, thing is the discipline and the in the commitment isn't it because without that no change will happen absolutely and that's a huge difference and i'm developing a whole team of uh, of moms as you said the strength of some of these parents and moms just constantly humbles me um and uh i have a couple moms out there now that are just like such good examples and they've worked so hard and you know and they are they're basically their job is to go and to support other moms but to also tell them you have to do this at this frequency you have to be consistent you it's all about the effort and we know it's not easy but there is a payoff, but the payoff's not there if you're not really consistent enough. So it is important. Yeah, and the nice thing is too, that as you are working through different things with different children, you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel because there are, because parents know their children so well, they see the subtle changes in them mm -hmm. before other people will see it, you know, right. which is really interesting. So, you know, those small wins are everything. Yeah. And, you know, we are constantly talking to parents about the small wins aren't really so small. You know, you get a child um, that all of a sudden starts to, you know, smell things and eat food differently or a child. I just got off the phone with a parent um, and they said, you know, that they always had to remind their child to go to the potty and pee. You know, he's young. He's only four. But, um, you know, and now he all of a sudden started doing it on his own because he now feels his own body. He's actually feels when he has to go. And along with that, he started wanting to connect with them more, right? So it's like these basic foundational feelings of things like pain and when you have to urinate and when you're hungry and thirsty and smell. These are basic foundational things that many kids with these right brain delays don't develop or are very underdeveloped. And that needs to develop first. And so, you know, all of a sudden a child starts to become hungry 
and they don't need to be reminded to eat anymore. They're all of a sudden thirsty. And to other people, it looks like, well, that's not a big deal, but it's huge when you really understand how the brain works. Yeah. Especially for a parent who's struggled for years to have a child eat anything. <laughs> so it's a big thing. Yes, absolutely. And that's the thing with, with the work that we're doing, um, uh, we see change pretty rapidly and pretty dramatically um, in all situations. And sometimes it can be scary for people, but that's what I always tell them. Change is good. You came here because you want to change. And, um, and even if the change doesn't always look good, it is generally. And, um, you know, and we just need to change, change the nervous system, change the brain, change the body. And that's what we're going to do. Phenomenal. Well, thank you very much for your time. I'm so grateful for you taking time for me today, particularly after your surgery. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. I, I'm, I'm excited to speak to you because I know you also do so much great work and help so many people and are so um, knowledgeable in what you do. And um, I wanted to share this with you and share it with your audience. And and I appreciate you going out there and spreading the word to people so we can just get more people engaged. That's all. Yeah. Well, I can't wait so we can get you back over here to do more teaching, which will be fantastic. <laughs> we'll look forward to that. You too. Right. Like so my it. eyeball's back on now. <laughs> So, right. So, well, hopefully I will see you very soon when things clear up in the world. It'd be great to have you over here teaching. In the meantime, thank you so much for your time, Rob. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure, Mary Ellen. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye.